All right, welcome to the Maintenance Community Podcast, a podcast for people who want to learn all things about maintenance and reliability. I'm your host, Ryan. I'm the CEO and founder of Upkeep. Each episode, I'll be meeting with an expert within our maintenance community to take a deep dive in a topic sourced from our maintenance community Slack group. Today, I'm super excited to have Jim Vantigum here on the show. Jim is a CMMS Senior Support Manager at Gentech Building Products. But before this, Jim has gained years of experience working in the maintenance reliability space in so many different roles. So welcome to this podcast, Jim. I'm super excited to learn from you. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited as well. The way that I always kick things off is by having you share a little bit more about yourself, your background, and how you were first introduced into this wonderful field of maintenance and reliability. Well, I started my career in the 80s as an auto mechanic, actually, class A auto mechanic, truck and coach mechanic. And then in the latter part of the 80s, I started my industrial career as an industrial mechanic, quickly worked up to a production supervisor and then off to a maintenance manager. Spent about six years at a plant level and how I got to where I am today, I sat on a plant floor and I looked around and I said, I'm tired of things are broken. The answer is I fixed it. So I was looking for a CMMS system at the time and our corporation purchased a, a software package for all of the 60 plants globally. And I took it upon myself to basically educate myself on the software and work my way up to a corporate level, implementing and training and being a support technician for that software. And also involved in helping to design and and test out different CMMS systems. So I was very fortunate at the time. So I had a lot of experience traveling around for about 14 years. Had the best job in the world. Got to travel globally, see new countries, new people, new faces all the time. So it was exciting. So and it 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 got me through the industry in different positions. So I'm here now at GenTech Building Products or Associated Materials supporting their CMMS system. That's awesome. And what, what an awesome journey into this space. It, what I hear from you is, you know, you, you've just been deeply fascinated by maintenance reliability and, you know, you're, you're cool going the, you know, leadership route, manager route. You're also really interested in technology and utilizing technology to help support you know, best practices for, for maintenance reliability teams. And it sounds like you've kind of spanned the gamut of different roles within the organization all across the world. What an awesome journey. Yeah, it, was. it has been. And it's, it's, you know, it's just, a, it's just a point in time, right? I still have a great journey ahead of me on, on different aspects of, of what I'm doing with the maintenance reliability world. So, you know, what I wanted to focus today's conversation on is, you know, oftentimes what can be an uncomfortable topic, especially around, you know, our industry. I know that you, Jim, have spent a great deal of, of time talking about the human aspect of maintenance and reliability and the people aspect of our industry. So I'd love to kind of take this time to learn from you about common frustrations and issues that people within our industry on the shop floor, what they face, what they deal with on a daily basis and what we can do to to fix it. To kind of kick things off, like maybe we could talk about what are some of the frustrations that, that you've seen her felt by the maintenance technicians and the management staff alike, you know, and why have you dedicated so much of your you know, time to focusing on, on you know, these topics, many of which you know, are kind of uncomfortable to, to discuss and talk about? Well, Ryan, uh, what I've learned along the way is that getting work done is easy. Getting people to do work is a much more difficult journey. And so when we talk about frustrations and so on, I never worried so much about, like I said, getting the work done, fixing or repairing equipment. It was more so understanding why people struggle to do so. And that said, we talk about frustrations. If we're going to do anything in a leadership or anything to that effect to try and be better, we have to link unknowns to knowns. So in our world, you know, we spend so much time talking about maintenance, preventive maintenance, reliability maintenance, FEMAs, a a whole host of gammas of different, you know, jargon that we use in our own in, in trying to maintain equipment. But we're no different than equipment, to be honest with you. And how we apply things to equipment is the same thing we apply to ourselves. A frustration is a behavior. And behavior, if you listen to Clive Lloyd, is based off of a a symptom of something else. It's like a feeling. And feelings are entrenched into our value system and our beliefs. 
So when we start to look at things uh, in the maintenance world, why we're not getting the results we're looking for or that we desire to get, we have to start looking at what those frustrations are that are causing us not to get to that point or what we believe is not getting us to where we need to get to or go. So when I talk about frustrations, if we talk about a maintenance mechanic, you have a maintenance mechanic, they spend time, especially in Canada, we're very much into license oriented mechanics. Young person gets out, gets into industry, wants to make a difference. They want to get on the floor. They want to fix that equipment. They want to do those PMs. And lo and behold, all their dreams are stifled within a, within a day. Because here we sit in reactive maintenance. We're just barely getting by trying to get our PMs done because we're not getting the equipment that we need. We're finding problems, but we're not getting any solutions or time or money applied to those solutions, or we're feeling like we're it's falling on deaf ears. We're given unrealistic time frames to fix equipment. It seems like uh, when things are at the 11th hour, which seems to be our life always, we're only given a specific period of time to get it done, and we're pressured to get it done. So when you start to look at these things, and there's a whole host of things, but we'll just uh, target in on a few things here. So when you look at a maintenance person who's coming in fresh, or you're talking about a veteran who's lived in this type of world over and over again and subjected to reactive maintenance, what do we do as an industry? We take great technicians, we take great learning, and we stifle that growth and we condition people to be reactive mechanics yeah. or reactive technicians or reactive managers. And in doing so, we're not giving them the skill sets to become better than they are. Yeah. We're giving them the skill sets just to act quickly and with Band-Aid solutions. So we're never having that real true get out of the trenches, 5,000 foot height to look at the landscape and see if we can really come up with permanent solutions. We're always stuck in the trenches. Now, when we talk about maintenance people, again, you know, as I, as I had pointed out, expected to work overtime with no choice in the matter never getting to do the corrective maintenance, barely getting PMs done, so on and so forth. If we look at the maintenance managers now, how many maintenance people or maintenance technicians have taken on the role as a maintenance manager? How many of the managers, whether maintenance or production or so on, have ever been into leadership training? How many of these people are given resources when asked that have no skill sets to meet the needs required for the role that they're trying to fulfill? We have a host of different problems that we face every day but what we don't do is we don't focus on the one that is screaming the most to us in industry it's the human side it's yeah. the trust building it's the psych safety it's the leadership that's not in place and that is some a lot of the the you know the uncomfortableness that happens you know we have managers that become entrenched in imposter syndrome they're brought to a level where they don't feel competent to do the job and then couple that with the Peter principle, where you're basically taken to the highest level of incompetence that you can get to with no support, no training, baptism by fire, only then to be chastised, never told anything that you may have been doing correctly, and to be let go or fired for basically that incompetence that was created by somebody else's uh, uh, doing. So we have this circle of control, we have a circle of influence, and a lot of us are stuck in that circle that's out of our control right. by someone else. So there's a host of things that we could talk about, but those are the common ones that I find with frustration. But mind you, you know, those frustrations are giving us intel, Ryan, tons of intel, just like you would find, surely, Ryan, you would find in your own software when you're developing software or people, people are giving you intel of what is frustrating them uh, with the use of the software or with data collection or, or sensors and so on. And what they're going to do is then they're going to let you know that by their frustrations. And then you in turn take the intel and try to make it better. Yeah. So we talked a lot about frustrations and so much of that resonates with me too. You know, obviously being in a manufacturing plant, having that be one of my first jobs as well. You know, we, we mentioned this idea of like, you know, coming out of college, like wanting to do all this great work, being stuck in a reactive mode and not really getting to do what I think people are really excited by, which is being better than they are, being better than they were yesterday. And when you're stuck in this reactive mode, I think what you called out, Jim, was when you're stuck in being reactive, you're focused on just trying to get by 
that same day and not thinking about how we can be better tomorrow. I, I guess the question that I've got for you, Jim, is what's the solution to all of this? We know that this is a common theme across every single industry, every single company. There, there is a little bit of this. What do we do? That's a, that's a great question. I, I, can't, I don't have a concrete answer for it, but what I do know is that, as I said, we, our audience is screaming, and so are we. We're screaming loudly with issues. We just have never been taught how to dig through and ask that Simon Sinek, why? Why am I feeling this way? Why am I having an issue? Why are my maintenance people having an issue? Why are my production people having an issue? Why is it that um, we can see that our equipment is not being taken care of, but we don't want to seemingly take care of it. So a lot of the solutions start with these frustrations. We conducted one here at the plant. We had a, uh, we brought the senior management team in, closed the door, and with the help of Rob Kalvarowski, we had a great conversation talking about frustration. No reprimands to anybody, just an open, honest conversation. It is amazing that the the uh, points that were brought forward that everyone seemingly did not know that the other was facing that were common and facing that were um, sticking points as well to their careers or to their movement in their roles and responsibilities. So it was a, it was a massive opportunity to start with understanding where we are, the gap analysis. Whether you're in, like I said, whether you're in the maintenance world or in a production world or engineering world, quality world, uh, in your world, as far as in, in the in the world of software support and development, start with a gap analysis. Where are you? Where do you want to be? And yeah. what is holding you back right now? If we do not know what is causing us an issue and we can't get to the why, we cannot formulate the how and what. And that is the start. So frustration meetings, allowing people to build build that trust with people that. Um, you know, you've, you've probably heard the word psychological safety quite a few times. And if you're ever in meetings with Rob, I'm with Rob, maybe once a week, we have these big conversations about this. If we don't get the trust in and allow our people to understand that we do care and that we show empathy and vulnerability to their plights of uh, trying to do better at their work or finding out what is stopping them from getting the results they're looking for, we're never going to take us to the next level. So when you're asking about what can we do, the first is take a big, honest look at where you are and where you want to be. Write down these problems. Be as honest as possible. And then from that, start to formulate, well, what can we do? What's yeah. the next step? We're not taught this, Ryan. We're not taught this at all. This is, the, this is the missing link that's been staring us in the face for decade after decade after decade. And finally, with a lot of changes in cognitive behavior and, and the social sciences and uh, starting to, uh, you know, starting to see the fruits of the founders of the 70s and 80s with near linguistics and psych safety and reliability maintenance and so on, we're starting to see that, hey, wait a minute, we're trying to take our glasses off and, and, and get away through, get ourselves through the fog and start to see that people make a difference. Yeah. In our world, Ryan, if if we want to make maintenance better, we got to get production under control. If production is not under control in our plants, we'll never get maintenance and engineering under control. Never. We'll never have. What I hear from that, Jim, is you know transparency, trust, and also acknowledgement. Acknowledgement that there is a problem, acknowledgement that there is frustration. I, I think oftentimes. You know, people, businesses are afraid to touch these uncomfortable topics, even the, the topics that we're talking about today. It's almost like the ignorance is bliss in many, many organizations. They know, mm -hmm. Everyone kind of knows that there are, are frustrations within the plant, but no one wants to acknowledge it. But I, I also think that a big reason why is because once you acknowledge it, the next step is to address it. Exactly. So I, I, I kind of really love the approach here, Jim, which is, again, like acknowledgement and then understanding what the gap is, you know, we can or someone can address that, that issue. I think the next question I've got for you, though, is, is like, who, who should be the one to do this? And I'll kind of frame it, frame this question. I think oftentimes, you know, I come in as a technician and I say, oh, that's the manager's job. That's, a, that's the leadership's job to, to do this, you know, gap analysis. Mm -hmm. um, 
what do you think, Jim? Is it on everyone? Is it on the managers? Is it on the technicians to raise their hand and voice their, you know, frustrations or help help management see the, the opportunities and problems? Leadership is leadership, whether you're a leader in your own life or whether you're a leader of a group of people, whether you're a leader at a plant level. It's a level of awareness. We're expect if we expected somebody at a plant manager's level to engage in this type of conversation, that person still has to start with a fundamental acceptance that there is a need for change. They have to understand that there is a, like a, the difference between a high achiever and a high performer. If you're the high performer and you understand that a change needs to happen, then their skill sets need to be in place. So that said, at a plant level, you would want your plant manager to be a person who would want to take ownership of such. But if you're the, if you're the leader of a maintenance group and you're a maintenance manager, you want to be able to create that foundational trust in your people to allow them to be leaders of their own life in the sense that they will, will open up and talk to you and express their concerns. It is not an easy thing. So the answer is kind of hard because it's it could be, you would want it to be everyone, but it is dependent on the person's level of acumen or uh, emotional intelligence to be able to take this and grasp it. I, for instance, in my position, I really don't have anyone reporting to me, but I've put my fingers in a lot of little, or my irons in a lot of fire here, and I take it upon myself to try and direct and, and bring people together. So there's an example of somebody from, a, from the outside of uh, the mainstream of the industry and, or the mainstream of the production process within a plant trying to make a difference. I've seen maintenance people, uh, maintenance technicians take leads and and based off of their acumen and their emotional acumen to understand that the need takes, needs to happen and will take it upon themselves to, uh, to voice their opinion. And if it's strong enough and it's part of their belief system and they value that growth, they're gonna do whatever it takes to get their point made. But I, I think what I hear from that, Jim, is that this is, this is a leadership problem. But what I also heard is that you don't have to be, or you don't have to have the manager title to solve this leadership problem. Exactly. It is step to the plate, take ownership and work to inspire people, to motivate people to be better at what they do. And it may be in yourself as well as the people that you're with. I love that. Jim, we are running up on the end of our show. What we always do at the very, very tail end of our show is do a quick quick fire set of questions. Sure. So if you're open to it, let's jump in. You ready? Absolutely. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Andy, piece of technology that you're most excited about or one that you think will leave an impact, a lasting impact on our industry? Most excited about? Right now, I'm using something called the Improver, which I think is very exciting. PDCA kind of program, but uh, Calvin Williams did a great job with it and uh, excited about the Leadership Launchpad program uh, also. Yeah. So I would say those two, th those two tools that we're using right now uh, really have me fired up. All right. I've spoken to both of those guys, Calvin and also Rob. Big shout out to those two. What's your favorite memory of the biggest win you've had in the maintenance reliability space? Oh my God. And this is back in the nineties, just a quick reader's digest condensed version. I was reading a book by Anthony Robbins called unlimited power. And uh, we talked about consistency and congruency. So as a maintenance mechanic and as a maintenance manager at the time, I was looking at the difference between two shifts, production shifts and why one would surpass the other with no common differences in the way the machines would run. Uh, long story short, I took a risk for which I could have been let go. And I formulated a see here touch plan of training, brought some supervisors and operators in on a Saturday. We did an in-class uh, training session, went to a machine, did a hands-on. And uh, long story short, what used to take uh, five or used to take 30 pieces to set up machine was down to five. Throughputs and yields went up on two shifts. The third shift, we identified a person that was not on the right seat on the bus. And long story short, that program proved itself and I used it in CMMS training as well. That's awesome. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> right, I'm going to ask the flip side of that question. Biggest mistake that you've made that you've learned a ton from. <laughs> I tell you what, basing emotions off assumptions. 
and may, and and that was a big one for me. Learning to ask better quality questions along the way, you know, when we're in this business, we have a lot of different scenarios that can happen, whether it's a people issue, a machine issue, process issue. And assuming that things are a certain way is not a good thing. I've had found that doesn't mean it's never going to happen in the future or that I still stumble across these things. But basing an emotion off an assumption without sitting back first, asking better questions and get in fact gathering was probably the thing I learned the most from and uh, it created some big mistakes. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Jim, for going through those quick fire set of questions with me. Last question I've got for, for you is, can you share with all of our listeners all the different ways that they can connect with you and, and follow you on your journey? Sure. Uh, I think the two most effective ways to, to follow or with me would be on LinkedIn and the upkeep uh, maintenance community. As I'm in there, uh, just fire as many questions as you wish. I plan on taking a lot of the experience here of late, and I'm probably going to post a lot of documents more on the human side of things, especially working with Rob Kalabrowski and, uh, you know, the likes of Tom Furness and uh, Furnival, I should say, and, and Bob Latino and so on. So that should be a lot of fun, should spark a lot of great conversation and something different than, uh, than the norm. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, again, Jim, for joining us. And thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in to today's episode of the Maintenance Community Podcast. Again, my name is Ryan. I'm the CEO and founder of Upkeep. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn, super, super active or on the maintenance community alongside Jim and you know, several, several others. Feel free to ask us any questions, follow up or suggest future topics for, for different podcasts. You can feel free to sign up at upkeep.org. I hope to connect with all of you soon. And thank you again, Jim, for, for all the time. Thank you very much, Ryan. It was a pleasure.